This video was made possible by our generous supporters on Patreon. Check out patreon.com slash nwr for all the details. Last month we got our first glimpse at the long-awaited Pikmin 4. No legitimate gameplay was shown, and our only real tease as to what would be new in this sequel was a still image, showing off a close-up camera rather than the traditional top-down views of prior entries. But amid the gameplay speculation rose another question. Is this trailer pre-rendered? Or is this legitimately a look at Pikmin 4's actual visuals? My name is John Rairdon, and outside of talking about Nintendo games, I also have a background in hobbyist animation and visual effects. I've worked on a bunch of tiny independent films you've never seen, some web series that you're even less likely to have seen, and some music videos that you haven't seen but you should watch because they're for some pretty neat songs. Realistically, the only animation work you'll likely have seen from me is right here on this channel. Point is, I have a lot of borderline professional experience with pre-rendered computer-generated animation, and by combining that with a passing knowledge of real-time rendering from years of covering video games, we're going to dig into this trailer and try to determine if it's real-time or not, and better yet, if it's possible on an actual Nintendo Switch. Now, for anyone completely unfamiliar with the concept of real-time versus pre-rendered 3D graphics, a super quick primer. Real-time graphics are what you're seeing when you're legitimately playing a game. These graphics are extremely optimized to render very quickly, as whatever system you're playing the game on has to be able to output an entirely new render of these graphics many times every second, most commonly either 30 or 60. But higher-end PCs and the latest generations of Xbox and PlayStation can push that number up into the triple digits. Point is, the fidelity of these images are entirely dependent on the systems generating them and the creativity of the designers behind them to optimize them. Things like texture resolution, draw distance, shadow resolution, and tons of other stuff can all affect the performance of these graphics. Pre-rendered graphics, on the other hand, are not constrained by needing to generate frames quickly, and can therefore have a near limitless degree of complexity that is essentially only limited by the tools available, the artist's ability, and how long they can afford to wait for a render. A CG character in a movie or an animated Pixar film is entirely pre-rendered. Now, of course, some games may use pre-rendered cutscenes, and these days some shows and movies use real-time graphics to create dynamic backdrops right on set with the actors, but that's a whole different conversation. The goal here is to identify telltale signs of real-time rendering or spot things that the Switch simply wouldn't be able to do at this level of quality in real time. It is worth noting that unlike the opening of the Tears of the Kingdom trailer, Nintendo didn't put a not-actual-gameplay tag at the bottom of this trailer. It's not conclusive by any means, but this is an early point for this being real-time. The trailer consists of three shots. A shot of some flowers with a butterfly, or a white spectralid, as it's canonically called, a second shot of what looks to be the underside of a park bench, and a third of a bulborb asleep near a fence. The opening shot of the white spectralid doesn't give us a ton to work with. Every object in the scene appears to be casting accurate shadows based on the position of the sun, meaning that if this is real time, they're unlikely to be pre-baked. These shadows also appear to go as far out as we can see, with no obvious drop-off in quality. We have some nice light rays filtering through the plants in the background, and it's worth noting that there is no flickering around the edges of the ray as the camera pans. Often effects like this are rendered at a fraction of the actual render resolution of the scene, which can result in some flickering artifacts when placed directly against other bits of geometry. The background is also nicely out of focus, with no artifacting around the edges of these plants. But we'll come back to that effect later. Finally, as the white spectralid flies away, you'll notice there is absolutely no motion blur on its wings. While motion blur is achievable in both pre-rendered and real-time graphics, it would be an odd choice to leave it off in a cinematic teaser like this if these shots were indeed pre-rendered. The next shot actually has the most telling bit of evidence in the pre-rendered versus real-time debate. This shot's use of depth of field is extremely impactful. Notice how both the distant background and the very near foreground are out of focus. This effect is important because it's very hard to pull off in real time without leaving behind artifacts, and we can actually spot two different types of artifacts in this shot. The first and most obvious is the foreground blur. Look at these flowers on the right side of the screen. They're all very out of focus, and yet they have a razor-sharp edge. 
Now look down at the leaves around their base. In some areas, their edges are nicely blurred, as they would be if this was a real object filmed with a real camera. Something pre-rendered graphics would have no problem replicating. But just a little higher up on the leaves, we see this very obvious gap that is sharp on all edges. So what's going on here? Well, their foreground focus blur appears to be looking at the image on a per pixel level. So if a pixel is near enough to the camera to be out of focus, it samples the colors of the pixels next to it and blends to create a blurred appearance. If not, then it remains nice and sharp. As long as a blurry pixel is next to another blurry pixel, it looks great, which is why these sections of the plant, towards the bottom, that are positioned in front of sections of the ground that is also out of focus, look great. But in a section a little higher up, where we can see through to the in-focus ground behind it, the leaves have a sharp edge. The engine can't blur that edge because it would need to know what's behind it, but the effect only has the visible pixels to work from. Now for the second giveaway. This one is a bit harder to notice. Farther back in the shot we see these two flowers that are still in focus. Behind them is some much more distant geometry that is very out of focus. If you look just next to the stem of the flower on the left, you'll notice the background sort of flickers as the perspective changes. Each of the flowers also has a sort of halo around them. Like the foreground blur, this blur can also only work with the pixels it has visible. As the camera changes and new pixels become visible, the pixels it has to draw from for its color change, and thus the resulting blurred pixel also changes. Add to this that the background effect doesn't appear to be rendering at the full resolution of the image, meaning that for every few real pixels, only one blurry pixel represents them, making the sudden shift of sample pixels more obvious. As for the subtle halo around the flowers, that's likely caused by the blur effect actually pulling the color of the pixels making up the flowers, resulting in the pixels around the flowers taking on some of their hue. Once again, in pre-rendered animation, the renderer would simply query what's behind that flower, but doing that in real time would be extremely expensive to your render times. And once again, if you want to output a smooth frame rate, you can't afford that. If you've heard the term ray tracing thrown around a lot this generation, that technology is actually perfect for solving issues like this. Ray tracing can be used for a lot of different applications, but it largely revolves around the probing of the scene, including what isn't on screen. It's been around in pre-rendered effects for decades, but we're only just reaching the point where it's applicable for real-time graphics at high quality. That being said, the Switch obviously won't be doing any ray tracing. It just doesn't have the horsepower to pull it off. So from that second shot, I feel pretty confident that this is indeed a real-time render. But this last shot threw me for a loop, specifically because it doesn't exhibit a lot of the artifacts we just saw. Based on the background flowers we looked at, you'd expect some flicker or glow around the edge of the fence, but it isn't there. The small plants at the bottom of the frame also don't exhibit the same artifacting as before. So if this shot is also real-time, how are they pulling it off? Well, let's start with the near-camera blur. This one had me stumped until I noticed a couple of things. This rock, which is at a slant, comes into focus along a straight horizontal line, not a slanted one. And the tops of these plants are in focus while the bottoms aren't, despite some of the ground being out of focus behind them. It doesn't make sense. The tops of the plants are actually closer to the camera than the ground behind them. If we draw a straight line from the point where the plants come into focus to the point where the rocks on the left come into focus, We'll see an old friend for those familiar with Nintendo's depth rendering techniques, the Bar of Blur. Yes, our favorite effect from the Switch remake of Link's Awakening returns. Rather than actually blurring near-camera objects based on proximity, a simple bar of blur is placed along the very bottom of the image. It's cheap to render, but it almost never gives accurate results. That being said, it is an easily achieved, real-time effect that we've seen used in first-party Nintendo titles before. The background blur requires a bit more guesswork, but I can tell you how I would do it. Pikmin games always transition into a large 2D skybox full of trees for their backgrounds. A skybox is essentially just a flat backdrop with a picture slapped on it. So if you want to save some rendering budget in a situation like this, use a pre-blurred skybox texture. Rather than using a nice sharp image of trees, I'd blur the image and apply that as the texture. You'd then get a look just like this, with the background blurry and absolutely no artifacts along the edge of the fence. It only works for extremely distant objects, but it's important to note that we don't see any nearer out-of-focus geometry in front of that skybox. 
meaning the engine may just not have anything it needs to worry about blurring back there. So after all that, yes, this does appear to be rendered in real time. But was it rendered on a Switch? Oftentimes when you see those advertisements for games that are rendered in-engine, they're certainly rendered in-engine, but on a supercomputer, well beyond anything you'll play it on. The PS3 trailer for The Last Guardian was famously rendered in-engine, but at half speed, meaning the engine had twice the time to render every frame, and then it was simply sped up for playback in the trailer. So when it comes to this trailer, are there things that seem unlikely to be running on an actual Switch? Well, the most significant area of suspicion I have is the shadows. Given that every previous Pikmin has operated on a full day cycle, the fact that these shadows are correctly oriented to the sun causes me to assume that they're entirely real-time dynamic shadows. In fact, in this still screenshot, which presumably shows actual gameplay, we can see what appears to be the area from the third shot in the trailer under different lighting. Given the absence of any obvious degradation in quality from shadow cascades as the shadows are drawn farther into the background, I find this somewhat suspicious. The absence of any artifacting around the light ray in the opening shot also could be evidence that this isn't running on a stock switch, but to be fair, the camera is also barely moving in that shot, which could hide such issues. All that being said, I'd call this borderline. We've seen some incredibly impressive looking first party games hit Switch. While studios like Monolith tend to sacrifice fidelity for scale, studios like Next Level Games have put out multiple titles on Switch that operate on high resolution with incredibly impressive rendering quality. Even Pikmin 3, despite being an early Wii U title, holds up fairly well compared to this trailer for Pikmin 4, though perhaps not at this level of micro detail. The assets themselves are largely in line with the assets from Pikmin 3. In fact, from what I can tell of this Bulborb's underlying geometry, he may literally be the same model from Pikmin 3. Same goes for the white Spectralid, which, compared to the rest of this trailer, actually sports somewhat low resolution textures. But the actual materials of the world itself seem significantly higher resolution. Pikmin 3's terrain tended to look quite blurry when the camera was brought in close, which can't really be said for this trailer for Pikmin 4. And that makes sense if they intend to have the camera lower down closer to the ground. So in conclusion, is this trailer real time? Yes, I believe it is. Is it running on stock Switch hardware? That's harder to tell for sure. It is right on the cusp of what we'd expect to be possible on the hardware, but it's not impossible. Do I think we're seeing Switch Pro or Switch 2 footage here? No, I don't. This would look very good for a Switch game, but I don't think it's impossible. Even my suspicions around shadow quality could largely come down to the fact that this is a compressed YouTube video and subtle details may be difficult to make out. Maybe the game merely fades between several levels of pre-baked shadows rather than being fully dynamic. We've seen this technique used before in Xenoblade titles, so it wouldn't be totally out of place here. But what do you think? Will Pikmin 4 be able to live up to the visuals present in this initial teaser? Or is this in no way even intended to represent the game's actual appearance? Hopefully, we'll see an actual gameplay trailer soon, and we can find out. Until then, thank you very much for watching. If you'd like to chat more about this, you can head over to our Discord, there's a link in the description, and you can also follow me on Twitter using the handle on screen. Check out NintendoWorldReport.com for a whole lot more, and stick around for information on our Patreon. This video is made possible by our generous supporters on Patreon. Did you know that Nintendo World Report is funded directly by fans like you? When you support Nintendo World Report on Patreon, you get immediate access to multiple exclusive podcasts every month, exclusive Discord channels, an early look at select content, and more. All for as little as a dollar a month. Check out patreon.com slash nwr for all the details.